Chapman's 105 mile an hour heater is the fastest pitch ever thrown. And that pitch wasn't a fluke. In one and a third innings, Chapman threw 25 pitches, and every one of them was clocked at over 100 miles an hour. But how does he do it? Shoulder turn. The twisting angles between his front hip and his back shoulder create massive torque. 80% of velocity comes from hip and shoulder separation. Elite power pitchers like Randy Johnson create angles of 40 to 60 degrees, but Chapman's is close to 65 degrees. Next, delivery. The thing that separates him is a lot of pitchers could get to that, but how soon does it get to here? The average pitcher uncocks his forearm in seven to nine hundredths of a second. Chapman's arm fires in less than four hundredths of a second. Average pitchers release the ball directly over the front foot. Chapman's release point up to 12 inches in front of his foot amplifies the difficulty of hitting him. Not only does he throw hard, he throws close. One The shoulder is a ball and socket joint that is the most mobile joint in the human body. It consists of the scapula, humerus, and clavicle that are all connected by a series of muscles, ligaments, and tendons. The three motions it carries out are flexion, abduction, and rotation, and these contribute to the many degrees of freedom it has. Due to the complexity of this joint and its motion, it is unrealistic to simplify into a model to be used in kinetic calculations in a video of this length. The most common injuries in baseball pitchers occur in the rotator cuff, which is what stabilizes the shoulder, and the labrum, which is what holds the ball in the socket. So here we're analyzing the anatomy of the elbow, and in particular the ulnar collateral ligament, which is providing the stability in the elbow from its medial rotation. The most important and most commonly torn band of the UCL in baseball pitchers is actually the anterior band, which connects the humerus to the radius of the forearm. The beginning phase of pitching is the windup, in which the pitcher generates power with his lower half. This then brings us to the stride and the foot strike, which is the beginning of the cocking phase. At the cocking phase, his hip-shoulder separation at this point is responsible for 80% of his velocity. This then leads us to the point of maximum external rotation. This point is the start of the acceleration of the arm, which is where most injuries occur, because the arm accelerates from extreme external rotation to extreme internal rotation. The ball is then released and the deceleration phase begins in which the arm pronates during the follow through to bring it to a stop. So now we're gonna be analyzing these three diagrams which are measuring the elbow flexion, the force of the elbow, and the torque on the elbow during pitching. And so basically we can almost ignore everything before this red line as that's just the basic parts of the wind up and breaking of the hands while pitching. And right at this red line is the arm cocking phase, which is really where all the force and everything is going to start accumulating. And this is going to build up for max external rotation at this point, which starts the arm acceleration phase. And the arm acceleration phase is going to lead us into the green line here, which is the release point, which shows you have the lowest angle, the lowest torque, the greatest force on the elbow of compression and after the release point we're going to hit the arm deceleration phase which is going to bring the force back up to zero. The figure shown represents the modulus of elasticity for the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow. The linear region of the modulus is rather short before it reaches the point labeled microscopic failure. This point is where the ligament may partially tear and reach a level of irreversible deterioration. At this point for a pitcher, they can try to rehab and return to pitching, but this will usually ultimately lead to the macroscopic failure or rupture of the ligament, which results in the player to require Tommy John surgery and an 8-12 to 12 month recovery period. 
The ultimate tensile strength of the UCL has been calculated to be about 33 newton meters. The following clip shows examples of what happens when the ligament is ruptured. Base is loaded, his arm just gives out, he collapses, a severe upper arm injury. It's one of the most disturbing sights you'll ever see in baseball. We could hear him screaming in pain from all the way up here in the broadcast booth. Big league ball players blowing out their pitching arms, and you never know when the curse will strike. And as he let that pitch go, the arm appeared to snap as well as we took a look on snap as well as we took a look on the replay. This is the Edwards and Penny model, which determines the acceleration of a baseball due to certain factors, such as the spin vector, the initial velocity, and the acceleration due to gravity. And what we're interested in is uh, solving this equation for the spin vector and analyzing the spin vector of two different pitches, fastball and a curveball. So the first step in solving for the spin vector is just adding the acceleration due to gravity to the Z component since that's already taken into account and that leaves us with the equation that the modified acceleration is equal to the spin vector crossed with the initial velocity and the cross product simply is just the magnitude of the spin vector times the magnitude of the initial velocity times the sine of theta and then solving for this equation gives us the magnitude of the spin vector is equal to the magnitude of the modified acceleration over the magnitude of the initial velocity times sine theta. And what this is going to be is our uh, velocity, angular velocity of the baseball given in revolutions per second. So since we don't have any data for theta, which is the angle between the spin vector and the initial velocity vector, we simply took theta to be equal to 90 degrees because the sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1 and that will produce the largest value for the magnitude of s. So in analyzing the spin of a curveball, we start off with taking the acceleration and initial velocity of the pitch, and we solve for the, mag the modified acceleration by dividing each of the components by c, and we took the magnitude of that, which is this value here, and we took the magnitude of the initial velocity vector, which is this value here, and we determined the magnitude of the spin vector by dividing the acceleration over the initial velocity, which in this specific case gave us a value of 41.47 revolutions per second. And this same process of calculations was taken for 10 different curveballs and produced an average of 46.36 revolutions per second for a curveball. And these same calculations were copied over again for a fastball, and the average of 10 pitches came out to be 65.31 revolutions per second. Which brings us to the question, if a curveball moves more than a fastball, why does it have a slower angular velocity than the fastball? So the reason that a curveball has a slower angular velocity than a fastball is because a curveball is also accelerating in the direction of gravity but a fastball is opposing the acceleration due to gravity, so this higher value for spin on a fastball is what keeps a fastball traveling straighter and is also the reason why a curveball has more movement to it. Well, hitters don't hit his fastball. chance with my stuff to just dominate baseball for years to come.